Wonderful. We are now live on Facebook. Thank you so much for being here, everyone, for this very important discussion. And I want to thank my staff for putting this together. And I want to thank the New Economy Project for being such an incredible organization here in New York City and for um, offering to do this presentation for our constituents. It's my pleasure to begin by introducing Susan Shin, who is the legal director for the New Economy Project. And she's gonna give us a presentation today about ways that we can all protect ourselves against unscrupulous actors in our financial system, debt collectors, other people who might be out there seeking to take advantage of us. And that's so important in today's economy because there are so many bad actors out there. Yes, there's many scams, but some of these folks aren't even scams. They're not even illegal. They're part of the system and they can hurt us if we don't have the tools to protect ourselves and we don't know what to, uh, what to do, what not to do, the do's and don'ts. So that's what the New Economy Project is here today to do, to walk us through these things, ways that you can empower yourself financially and protect yourself against some of these uh, traps that are out there. So Susan, thank you so much for being here. We're gonna, um, have a presentation from you, and then we're gonna open it up to questions. Um, Sean, are there ways for people to ask questions throughout? Yep, By they can message any of the co-hosts in the chat, and we'll be able to uh, send those along to Susan, or if folks would like to raise their hand, we can unmute them and have them ask their question. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So Susan, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Council Member Botcher, and thank you to your staff. Um, it's really great to be invited to, to speak to you all today. So I will now go ahead and start sharing my screen. Okay, so hopefully you can all see that. Yes. Great. So my name is Susan Shin, and I am the legal director at New Economy Project. We are an economic justice organization based here in New York City. At New Economy Project, we work to create an economy that works for everyone based on cooperation, equity, social and racial justice, and ecological sustainability. And more specifically, we work with community groups to fight against redlining, predatory lending, debt collection, and poverty, and we work to also build and support cooperative and community-led development, um, including economic models such as community land trusts, worker co-ops, and community development credit unions. So through our work, we've seen that there is a continuum of abusive financial practices from redlining to predatory lending and abusive debt collection. And we've also seen that these abusive financial practices are disproportionately harming communities of color, seniors, women, and are reflected in the credit reports of people living in these communities. And unfortunately, as many of you know, credit reports are used to deny people opportunities in many different contexts, including housing, insurance, and credit. And so these abusive financial practices really have an enormous impact on people's lives and result in huge amounts of wealth being extracted from whole neighborhoods in New York City. Um, whoops, sorry about that. Let me go back. Uh, Sorry, I just have to find my way back. Here we go. So um, as part of our work, we operate a free legal assistance hotline to help low-income New York City, uh, City residents harmed by these abusive financial practices, including abusive debt collection, predatory lending, unfair bank practices, and credit reporting issues. So I'm here today to share information with you all about our hotline 
in case it's helpful to you or to your neighbors, and to describe some of the issues we frequently hear about on our hotline. And as the council member mentioned, I'll be sure to leave some time at the end uh, to answer any questions that you may have. So here you can see our hotline phone number at the bottom and our hours of operation. And the council member staff will be helping us to share this hotline flyer with you all after this presentation. So as you can see, our hotline is called the New York City Financial Justice Hotline. And through this hotline, we help low income New York City residents who are dealing with various financial justice issues. We also have a lot of, use, of useful Know Your Rights information on these topics on our website, um, which is fjhotline.nyc. You can see it there at the bottom on the flyer, and I believe um, it will be posted in the chat as well. So as you can also see, our hotline is open four days a week, Monday through Thursday, and we do have a hotline staffer who speaks Spanish. And we also have an interpretation service that provides interpretation in many different languages. You can also contact us by going on our website and filling out an online intake form, and that's form.fjhotline.nyc, and I believe that will be posted in the chat as well. So if that's more convenient, please feel free to contact us that way, or if you're unable to call during the hours, our hotline may be open. And our hotline is staffed by our wonderful staff attorneys, a paralegal, and sometimes our wonderful law interns. And these are all highly trained uh, individuals and closely supervised by yours truly. And we have a lot of expertise on legal issues related to these topics, debt collection, credit reporting, unfair bank, bank practices, and more. And so during this presentation, I'll be discussing a few examples of what we tend to hear about frequently from low income New York City residents and what we are able to do to help. But before we get to that, I would love to share with you all an excerpt from a video of one of our hotline callers, a New Yorker named Miss Sandoval. And she is here sharing the story of what she went through at the hands of debt collectors and the courts. And just to set up this excerpt for you all, she called our hotline after she received a notice saying that her wages were about to be garnished. And it was only then that she learned that a debt collector had sued her and gotten a court judgment against her about 15 years ago. And even though she called the debt collector and went to court many times trying to figure out what this was all about, she had a really hard time getting even the most basic information that might have helped her figure out what this was all about, if this was a debt she actually owed. And as you can see, she had a lot of trouble navigating the court system. So I will go ahead now and play this. What was really astonishing to me was that. And can you all hear the sound just to check? Great. Okay. They said it was a $300 debt. Um, actually, it was a little less. But what they were garnishing me for was close to two thousand dollars. I think it was like fifteen hundred dollars because they had um, late fees, penalties. They had attorneys fees. They had the uh, marshals fees on there. They had processing fees. They had all these fees. I think that the collection agencies have too much free reign over buying debt um, that maybe has been paid or, um, you know, and just don't give people a chance to to really speak their piece they're just they just tell you this is what you owe pay it or this is what's going to happen i don't think that a regular person like me has a chance ever at all and i think the collection agencies know it i think the attorneys representing the collection agencies know it i think i just got very very lucky um that this organization was one of the ones that i reached out to and someone called me back but it shouldn't be about luck So Ms. Sandoval fortunately ended up getting a good outcome in her case, but she did have a really hard time getting to that point. And um, we hope that any of you, if you're in a similar situation, you will call our hotline and we can try to help you navigate all of these issues as well. So next we'll get into a discussion, as I mentioned, of some of these issues we frequently hear about, but we're going to kick things off with a, cute, a, a quick true false test for you all. What was Oops, really me, astonishing to whoops. me was, okay, let me see if I can get to that. Here we go. 
So true or false, a debt collector can take someone's social security benefits for a credit card debt. And if you could indicate in the chat true or false, or maybe put a, post a thumbs up for true and a thumbs down for false. And then maybe the, uh, the staff can help me figure out how the winds are blowing here. Seeing a lot of false responses. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Great, so this is false. A debt collector cannot take someone's social security benefits for credit card debt. And it's wonderful that uh, many of you already know that. Um, and actually many types of income, especially government benefits, but also a big percentage of someone's earned income from wages are legally protected from debt collection. And this is one of the topics that you can read more about on our website or learn more about if you call our hotline. So debt collection issues in general are probably the most common topic we hear about on our hotline, including from older New Yorkers. So we hear about a range of debt collection issues from excessive phone calls and letters to lawsuits and frozen bank accounts or wage garnishment. So starting with calls and letters, many people call us because they're getting a lot of these and they can be even from debt collectors that these people have never heard of. So they have a really hard time understanding what's going on. And we can help people figure out where these calls and letters are coming from, and we can help you demand that these debt collectors stop contacting you. So, for example, we heard from a senior who was having a really hard time keeping up with the minimum payments on their credit card because they were living on a fixed social security income. So every week she was getting a lot of calls and letters and was getting really stressed out by all of this. So we helped her prepare a letter telling the debt collectors to stop contacting her. And under federal debt collection law, debt collectors have to comply with your request that they stop contacting you. And we also let her know that her social security benefits are protected under the law and the debt collectors could not take any of her social security income for these credit card debts that she uh, allegedly owed. And just knowing this, and being able to tell the debt collectors to stop calling her really gave her a lot of peace of mind and helped her to redirect her fixed income to cover her basic living expenses, such as her rent, her medication, and groceries. Okay, so next we'll go to um, a second true or false quiz for you all. Debt collectors stopped suing people during the pandemic. Is that true or false? False. Are we getting a lot of falses? We're getting a lot of falses. Okay, this is a savvy crowd. So yes, that is false. Debt collectors very unfortunately continue to sue people during the pandemic. We really saw um, an attitude that, you know, they're just going to proceed with business as usual, despite all of the tremendous financial and physical and emotional and health hardships that people were going through. Um, there is, there was um, one of the bright spots in all of this was that there is a, a May 2021, uh, 2021 New York State law that we helped to get passed that bars debt collectors from seizing stimulus funds. So especially right around that time, May 2021, and in the months there after this was very helpful for people who were receiving COVID-19 related stimulus relief funds. So in general, we hear a lot from people who've been sued in court by debt collectors who are dealing with these debt collection lawsuits. So every year, debt collectors are filing huge numbers of lawsuits against low-income New Yorkers. And many of these people are not finding out the right way. They're only finding out way after the fact. So a debt collector will sue them, but like you saw in um, with Ms. Sandoval, she didn't find out about this lawsuit until 15 years later. And that's because a lot of debt collectors aren't simply not telling people that they've been sued. So what we do um, to help people, you know, if you do get court papers saying you've been sued, we really strongly recommend that you seek legal advice as soon as possible to see what steps you should and could take and what legal defenses you may have. So if you call our hotline, for instance, we can give you advice on all of this. We can help people to prepare the written response they need to file with the court with their legal defenses to these lawsuits. 
And relatedly, we also hear from a lot of low income New Yorkers who urgently need help because their bank account has been frozen or because their wages are being garnished. So here's what often happens. If a debt collector sues someone for an alleged debt, the debt collector may be able to get a court judgment, especially, as I mentioned, if the person sued was never given notice of the lawsuit and therefore didn't respond to the lawsuit. And the court judgment will say that the debt collector is entitled to a certain amount of money. The debt collector can then use that court judgment to freeze the person's bank account or garnish their wages. And unfortunately, in New York State, judgments can be enforced in these ways for at least 20 years, and the judgments accrue interest every year. So what can we do to help? We can help people get access to any exempt, exempt funds they may have and to challenge the judgment in court. So we've been able to help a lot of people to undo or cancel these judgments so they're just eliminated. So to share a story along these lines, we heard from an older New Yorker living off a pension and social security income who had their debit card denied at a supermarket. When he went to his bank to ask what was wrong, he was just told that his bank account was frozen. So he luckily learned about our hotline, called us, and we helped him to explain to the bank that all of the funds in his account were exempt pension and social security funds and that his account should be released. So his account fortunately was released and we also helped him to figure out what had caused the freeze in the first place. And what it turned out that a debt collector had actually sued him many years ago, gotten a judgment against him, but he had never known about this until his account was frozen. So again, in a situation like that, we can help people prepare the court papers they need to challenge the judgment and also connect them with legal resources that may be able to help them on their actual court date. So in a nutshell, we can tell New Yorkers about the rights and protections available to them when dealing with these kinds of debt collection issues. And we can also help people prepare dispute letters and court papers that people may need to fight back against unfair or aggressive or abusive debt collection efforts. And you kind of got an inkling through uh, of this and one of the true and false questions touched on this, but one of the protections I wanted to really emphasize today is that certain forms of income, such as social security and other government benefits are generally exempt from debt collection. So 90%, for instance, of any wages you've earned in the last 60 days are also generally exempt. And New York law also makes sure that a certain amount of money in your bank account up to $3,600 is automatically protected and cannot be legally taken by debt collectors. And this is thanks to a very important New York state law called the Exempt Income Protection Act. There's more info about that on our website. And this law prevents debt collectors from taking all the money in people's bank accounts and leaving them without enough money to get by. So similarly, we also hear from a lot of people dealing with credit reporting issues, which can be very related to debt collection issues. Um, and one of the things we can help people do if you're calling us um, about credit reporting issues, we can help you to, um, we can give you information about how to get a free copy of your credit report and, and, and give you um, information about your rights to dispute, for instance, inaccurate information that's showing up on your credit report. So we can talk to you about how to prepare a, a dispute letter to credit reporting agencies, and we may also be able to help you to actually prepare that dispute letter. So I wanted to touch on some specific credit reporting issues related to medical debt because there are some new policies that are in place or soon to be in place. So here is our final true or false question for you all. Medical debt is always reported on your credit report. Is that true or false? False. Okay, are we getting a lot of falses? Yep. All right. Again, very, very smart crowd here. So it is false. Medical debt is not always reported on one's credit report. And this has become more true. And as I mentioned, there are new protections currently and or soon to be in place limiting the reporting of medical debt. And I want to just go through these because these are really 
important, I think, for a lot of people to know, especially if you are in a situation, unfortunately, where you may be having to deal with a lot of medical debt. So paid medical debt is no longer reported by the big three credit bureaus. So those are Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. So a lot of debts, even if you've paid them, they will still show up for a certain amount of time. But now medical debt, if you pay it off, it will be removed from your credit report or if it, or it should be. And that's something we can help you with if it's been paid and is not removed. A second important change is that medical debt that goes into debt collection will not be reported unless that medical debt is at least a year old. So that is, the idea behind that is to give people time to work out whatever issues they may be having with their insurance provider, um, because a lot of times that's what's really causing a bill to go unpaid because an insurance provider is not doing what they may be supposed to do. So medical debt in collections won't be reported until the debt is at least a year old. And then uh, a change to look forward to is that starting in the first half of 2023, medical debt that is under $500 will not be reported. So hopefully those changes, you know, significant, we always need more change to these kinds of credit reporting issues, but hopefully those changes will be helpful to, to people. Um, we also do hear from hotline callers about unfair bank practices that, that they may be dealing with. So for example, we've heard from people who've experienced fraud on their bank account, but when they've reported the fraud to their bank, their bank has actually turned around and accused them of being complicit in the fraud. Then they'll send them to collections. They may report them negatively to one of these consumer reporting bureaus, making it really hard for the person to open a bank account anywhere else for many years. And these issues can be very challenging to resolve, but we can talk to you about any legal protections and legal options that may be available to you, such as dispute letters to your bank or complaints to federal and state regulators. And I want to mention that, you know, even though we are a hotline for financial justice issues, we do also provide a lot of referrals on other kinds of issues that we don't specialize in, such as housing or benefits. So it may be that somebody calls us with a financial justice issue, such as debt collection, but also has a housing issue um, or a benefits question. So we can provide referrals on a lot of these issues. And one particular referral that I would like to highlight for everyone here is um, the referrals we can provide to free financial counselors. And we have seen that financial counseling can be very helpful to people, including to many older New Yorkers who may be having trouble keeping up with their credit card payments, especially if they are on a fixed income. And we have seen that unfortunately, there are a lot of scam debt relief companies out there that promise to help people get rid of their debts as long as you pay them a monthly fee. But those scam debt relief companies really end up putting people in much worse financial hardship. So we have helped people to write dispute letters and in some cases recover money from these companies. And then we'll redirect, re redirect these people to the free financial counseling resources that are available to people, really to anybody. This is not just for low-income New Yorkers, but really to any New York City resident um, or anyone who works in New York City. And before I wrap up um, with this part of the presentation and go to Q&A, I did want to also mention that we've been seeing um, an, an uptick in calls generally about scams where somebody will call you to say, hey, there's a problem with your bank account or your credit card and you need to share certain personal information with us right away if you want the person, the problem to be resolved. And obviously the, the idea behind these calls is to scare people into sharing their personal information. Um, we have seen that unfortunately the banks are very unwilling to help people when they're scammed like this. So just to try to you know, encourage people to um, to try to avoid these situations, you know, be very, very wary of any such calls that you get out of the blue that try to scare you into giving up your personal information. Um, we would recommend ignoring calls from phone numbers you don't recognize. And if you are concerned that there may be an actual problem with your bank account, for instance, we would recommend that you actually go to the bank branch in person or call your bank's official customer service number as shown on your account statements or on the back of your credit or debit card. 
So that's all I have today before our, we get into the Q&A, um, but I do just wanna go back to our hotline flower, flyer, which again, uh, council member Botcher staff will be sharing with you after the presentation. So hopefully you'll have all that information handy and can give us a call so we can try to help with whatever financial justice issue you are dealing with. And here, I just wanna leave this slide up for a moment so you can follow us on social media if you would like. You can see all of our social media handles right there. So I'll leave that up while we take some questions. Susan, someone was wondering if the new economy project. Oh, sorry, I was on mute talking. Oh, there we go. I Got apologize. it. Susan, you can take that off uh, the, the, the slide down if you want. Okay. We'll Great. see each other. Um, Susan, of all the things that you outlined today, what are the most common issues that people call in with to the new economy project? Probably debt collection issues. Um, so, and, and very often, unfortunately, it's with um, a lawsuit they've just heard about because maybe they got um, some court papers in the mail. That's not the, the only, you're supposed to be served with court papers in a way that um, makes sure that you actually get notice of it, but some people don't get notice or they just get it in the mail. Um, and unfortunately, some people call us in a panic because they've just learned that their bank account is frozen and then they, they are concerned they have no access to any money. So those are probably the most common issues we hear about. So in other words, someone gets a lawsuit uh, served with papers and they had never been, they had never heard about it before and uh, they're seeking your guidance on what their rights are in that situation. Exactly. And we can talk to them about what they would need to do to respond to the lawsuit by when they should respond to the lawsuit. We can try to help people figure out just what they might be sued on. So a lot of times people don't even recognize the name of the company that sued them. And that's because a lot of times the banks or credit card issuers are actually selling credit card debts to companies called debt buyers. And then the debt buyer is the one that's actually suing people. So people often have never heard of these companies, have no idea what this is all about. And we can help people try to figure all of that out and know what their rights are to defend themselves against those lawsuits. Wow, terrifying. Um, I see Yarrow has a question. Can we unmute? I'm gonna ask to unmute you, sir. Um, Thank you, I'm a woman. Hey, I'm sorry. I, I, Adam. <laughs> I couldn't see your, your picture. I only see the text. That's okay, Eric. Uh, my question is this. My issue is with Spectrum. I moved out of an apartment three years ago, over three years ago, and I look on my credit report, which has nothing else but this $84 I supposedly owe Spectrum. And what happened was I was paying in advance and I moved out of the apartment. Actually, I was evicted. I have a marshal's notice. I paid over that, but they're claiming I owe them $84. At a certain point, I received a letter saying, oh, they'll take $64. And I was like, yeah, that's nice. You didn't even give me the services. You're not getting $64, but I want to know like how to deal with that. And I, I've tried to contact like the attorney general's office, they were totally useless and, um, you know, don't get my vote and uh, in the next election, but, you know, what do I do about that? Yeah, it can be difficult to deal with Spectrum and other providers like that. Um, we have often advised people to, you know, if, for instance, if you've communicated with a company like that only by phone, that it's helpful to put things in writing and attach any supporting documentation that you may have. And a lot of times, you know, those companies will send these kinds of bills or alleged debts to collection, and then there are more rights 
that you have when a, a bill or an alleged debt is sent to a debt collector and you can send them a dispute letter. We can we have a sample on our website. We can talk to you about how to go through that process. And there are various rules and laws that actually require debt collectors to provide you with information about the debt. And you know you can dispute it and say, this isn't yours, send me more information. Um, and hopefully that will stop it. If they go so far as to try to, you know, sue you on this kind of debt, then we can talk to you about your rights defending on that. Although on a debt that, um, on alleged debt that's small, I don't think they would go that far and hopefully it would be stopped in the debt collection dispute process. Well, I did speak to Spectrum and then Spectrum was saying, I mean, no one was in the apartment for like three months because I was evicted. I have the marshal's notice. So Spectrum is saying, well, we have no way of knowing nobody used it. Well, that's a lie because I used to live in Rockaway and the wind would knock out the cables. So they would, I would, they would call me and then send the signal to find out if it was working or not. So they know it wasn't on, but mm -hmm. they did send it to a debt collection agency that's somewhere in the Midwest that's probably a subsidiary of Spectrum. Yeah, so if it has gone to a to debt collection agency, I would encourage you to go to our website um, at fjhotline.nyc, that's F as in Frank, jhotline.nyc. And we have um, a lot of information there about what, to, what your rights are with respect to debt collectors. And we have a sample dispute letter for New York City residents that they can send to debt collectors. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. I'm not going to pay that. I don't care. If they want to take me to court for $84, they could go right ahead because I know I could counterclaim on them. Mm -hmm. But like you said, I highly doubt, unless they have a lot of people that they're suing that day. That's it the only like, way yeah. they would do it. If, if they were if they were silly enough to try to take you to court on a, on a debt or in a bill that size, um, it sounds like you have um, some good defenses you could raise. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Monica, hi, Monica. Ask to unmute, there you go. Okay, great. Uh, hi, Eric. Um, thanks so much for, for having this uh, event. I'm 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 kind of shocked that half of New York is not on the Zoom because <laughs> it seems to me like everybody's getting scammed in one way or the other, and even I was scammed. And I think I'm pretty uh, careful about who I answer the phone to, and and I'm aware of uh, someone who's a poser. But the other day, well, you know, a week ago, whatever, two weeks ago, um, I got a call from from someone saying he was from Verizon. And I immediately believed that Verizon could screw up. So, <laughs> so I immediately believed there was an issue. Um, and uh, even though I knew that I was completely paid up with with Verizon and have been in a on auto pay, but in any case, uh, he sufficiently convinced me that there was an issue and transferred me to someone else. And, you know, I said, well, I'll just, I didn't want to go to the Verizon office. And he said, fine, we'll take care of it. You have to put a payment on Zelle. Oh, no. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> I, I didn't even know what Zelle was, frankly. Monica. I, yeah, I just don't know what Zelle is. Uh, so it sounds like a girl. Uh, so... I, um, he asked me for, uh, I don't remember, $270, $287, which had nothing to do with my Verizon payment. So I didn't know where he got that from. So I had to load onto Zelle. I loaded onto Zelle. And then he asked me for another $287. And at that point I said, no, this, this is not right. So, so he said, yeah, I just give another two. And then another two, I said, no, I'm not not going to do that. And he said, well, you're going to be disconnected uh, automatically. And I said, well, we'll see what happens. So at that point, I called my bank, which is Chase Bank. And they had accepted the cell, but they said that it wasn't processed until end of day. That that's their, that's their, the way their banking, uh, technology is, is, is set up. So I said, well, I know this is a scam. And they said, yes, you've been scammed. 
I said, so you are not going to process. It's not going to land until end of day, midnight. Can you just stop it? Can you cancel it? And they refused. Chase Bank refused. So this happened um, at about noon, you know, somewhere around noon, because I was in my car, I know. <laughs> and, and it didn't process until midnight. I must have called them by 1230, you know, for a full half day earlier. And they said, no, there's nothing we can do to, to, uh, to annul it. So is that, what can I do to chase in this case is my question. Because they told me they were gonna open, um, they were gonna open a file and study it. So I followed up with them because I never heard from them and they never did open a file. They have no record of opening a file. They never opened a claim. They simply ignored me. Yeah, this is a, a very difficult kind of issue. So when I mentioned, you know, this won't be the most satisfying answer. I'll say that right up front. Um, but when I talked about how banks, um, it can be very difficult to resolve these kinds of issues with the banks. This is the kind of issue that um, one of the issues that I was thinking of. This is a very live issue that's happening right now to a lot of people over the country. Um, around the country, there have been a lot of news articles about this. And Zelle is actually, um, I believe Zelle is owned by a company called Early Warning Services, which is actually owned by a group of big banks. So the banks are very yeah. invested Chase, in this. And Chase is one of the banks, I believe. I believe so. And 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 yeah. they're not actually, um, you know, they own this service, but they're not actually putting in all the consumer protections that, you know, a lot of consumer advocates um, believe should be in place to protect people against these kinds of scams. You know, for instance, being able to stop these payments before they get processed if they get, you know, a, enough advance notice. So, you know, I know uh, someone had mentioned earlier that sometimes going to the attorney general and filing a complaint is, is useless. And that may be true sometimes, um, and it could be true in individual cases, but it is, you know, I would strongly encourage um, any of you, if you're dealing with an issue where a bank is being difficult to file a complaint with the New York State Attorney General's Consumer Frauds Bureau, because the more they hear about these things, the more they may look into it. And also the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is the federal consumer protection agency. Um, and again, the more complaints they hear about an issue, the more that they will try to look into it. I have seen that a lot of people are, you know, banding together, I think, in some class action lawsuits to sue um, the banks over these kinds of security issues um, and these kinds of scams uh, that are happening. So I totally get that this may not be the most satisfactory answer, but um, if that does happen to, to any of you and you are a low-income New York City resident, you, know, you can call our hotline and we can see if there are any steps, any legal options or hooks that we may be able to discuss with you. Well, I did file a, a complaint, uh, followed the forms with the AG. Oh, great. And absolutely nothing happened. Yeah. H have you tried filing one with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau? No. Okay. So I would encourage I mean, you I don't to really, I'm not in a situation where this, this money is a big issue for me, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I don't want to spend oodles of time on it. Sure, sure. But this is clearly just, you know, a drop in a very large ocean of fraud against yeah. the public. And yeah. it's infuriating. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, yeah. So hopefully the, the, like the- Anything you can do about it. Yeah. What about the State Department of Financial Services? Do they have authority over Yeah. The well, th the problem a lot of times is that the banks that people are with are these national banks, and then our State Department of Financial Services won't have jurisdiction over them right. and um, won't be able to really do anything. That's why even though um, you know the Attorney General is a state agency, I think it is still good for them to hear about these sorts of issues. Someone mentions in the chat the control of the currency, and they do also oversee the, the big national banks, but unfortunately we've seen that they're not really um they they might be doing the least to actually help people um, who file complaints with them so i think the best the best place the best regulator to file a complaint with is the the, the federal consumer protection agency the consumer financial protection bureau thank you so much thank you thank You're you welcome. um sorry that happened to you monica uh we had a question in the chat 
and I'm going to read it. I was contacted by a quote, well-known corporate consultant, unquote, on Instagram to invest in Bitcoin. I did not realize until it was too late that the Instagram account was fake and originated in Nigeria. I ended up sending $600 in Bitcoin and was not allowed to withdraw the money from a company whose website lists it in upstate New York. I contacted the DA's office and their response is that 600 is too low for them to pursue, even though it's clearly a scam involving a bogus Instagram account. Instagram will not close down the account. The Manhattan DA is a nothing as well as the New York State Attorney General's Office about the scam website. Is there any recourse as the company has a copy of my driver's license and I'm concerned with identity fraud as well as the money that's been stolen? Yeah, this is another very difficult situation. You know, to address the identity theft, um, there are some steps that people can take to try to guard against identity theft or to guard against consequences of having some of your personal or financial information revealed. And um, so the Federal Trade Commission, which is another federal agency, has um, a good website. I think it's identitytheft.gov. I don't know if someone maybe on the council member staff might be able to pull that up. Um, and they also have a version of that website in Spanish as well. And it actually has um, kind of a questionnaire that you go through and says, what's the situation, which context is this happening in, and they can um, point you to certain steps to take. And there are um, some steps that you can take also to protect your, your credit. So there are things that you can do such as a fraud alert or a security freeze. So you can put one or the other of those on your credit files with the big three credit bureaus. And then they, they provide some extra barriers to anybody who might try to use your personal information to open, for instance, a credit card account in your name. Um, those kinds of scams are really difficult, even though you may not be able to get relief um, uh, you know, in the form of a refund, I would still encourage you um, if you can, to file a complaint with, you know, these federal or state consumer protection agencies, because we are always, we talk to them very frequently, and they're always telling us, you know, when we, we, we if we hear the complaints, if we're hearing from a lot of people, then we can, you know, then we'll have some things to go on, then we can do, try to do something about it. Thank you so much. The Bitcoin scam, it's like Instagram, I feel like I'm getting constantly message about it. and there are a lot of their their hijacked accounts i know people have had their account hijacked and then that account tends to be, then messages everyone um someone asked does the new economy of project need volunteers <laughs> that's great um thank you to whoever asked that um we do sometimes volunteers and so you can reach out to us. Um, um, I, I, I think for this would be um, info, I-N-F-O at neweconomynyc.org, uh, O-R-G. Oh, wonderful. We'll put that in the, in the chat as well. Does anyone else have any questions before we wrap for the day? Um, Actually, council member, I do see a question in the chat, if I can go oh, ahead yeah, and read that ahead. and try to address that. So Geraldine has a question. How does a creditor go about garnishing your paycheck? Can you work with a creditor to stop the garnishment once in action? So a creditor, um, in order to garnish someone's paycheck, um, if you're in a New York State or a New York City resident, they have to have gotten a court judgment first. So it means that they've sued you in court and gotten a judgment against you that says they're entitled to a certain amount of money. And especially if you never knew that you had been sued, we can talk to you about a lot of defenses and uh, that you can raise in some court papers that you would file and to tell the court, hey, I never knew this happened to me. I need a fair shot at defending myself. And so that process very often, you know, can lead to the garnishment being stopped, to people's money getting returned to them, and the judgment um, that would that caused the garnishment in the first place being canceled or vacated, they call it. Um, and you can work with the creditor to stop the garnishment once in action, but we would strongly recommend to everyone that you first seek legal advice because um, if you try to work with the creditor first, you might inadvertently um, maybe admit something about the debt 
when you might actually have some defenses you can raise and get all of your money back. So we would strongly encourage you um, to, to seek uh, legal advice. And again, if you're a low-income New York City resident, we can help you through our hotline. That's great. That's really great to hear. Um, wonderful. Well, I really wanna thank everyone for calling in today. And I really wanna thank you, Susan, and the New Economy Project. It's so important to get this information out for people because it's not information that you hear all the time. And there's not a lot of venues for getting this information. So I really wanna encourage everyone to save the contact information for the New Economy Project. You could also email our office at district3 at council.nyc.gov if you have any questions and we can direct you to the appropriate place. I wanna thank everyone who called in today and I look forward to continuing this discussion in the future, very important topic. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Kevin, you can go ahead and end the meeting for all, please. <laughs>